fan translated NES games. What am I talking about? I'm talking about NES games that never had an official release in English, but have since been translated by fans and made available online. A bit like fan subs for anime, but with video games. Typically these games are distributed as patch files which you can apply to your legally acquired ROM image of the original game. You can play them on emulators, you can play them on a flash cart. The whole thing is a bit of a grey area, but there are some more legally dubious ways that these things are distributed too. You can buy repros or maybe just outright counterfeits, physical cartridge copies of these games too. Google is as ever your friend when it comes to tracking down this kind of stuff. There's an awful lot of NES games that never got translated into English, and this is a list of some of my favourites. It's not top five or anything like that, it's not scientifically determined, it's just some games that I think are worth a look. The patch files for all these games are available from romhacking.net, that's the major hub for this kind of thing on the internet. I'll put a link to it below, but you don't need a link, it's just romhacking.net. Have a look, you'll find these games and many others on there, but not the original ROM files, you're on your own if you want to find them. Let's get started then with Downtown Special Kunio Kun no Jidai Geki. Deo Zenjin Shugu, or in English, Downtown Special. It's Kunio's period piece. Assemble everyone! Yeah, the developers may not have been into brevity, but they were into making good games. And this is pretty fine. It's a sequel to the cult classic River City Ransom. Like the first one, it's a kind of early open world RPG beat em up thing. This time out, it's set in feudal Japan, and whilst the gameplay isn't that different from the original, it's bigger, there's more stuff to do, there's more areas, there's more towns. Titular character Kunio's got some more moves. You can bounce around in a bucket, you can attack people with a wheelbarrow, you can pick up stricken foes and toss them around the screen. Gritty, realistic combat, you know what I mean? There's a few additions to the formula that was developed in the original River City Ransom. The gangs you fight, they don't stay in the same place, they roam around the countryside, you have to go and find them. And even in single player mode, you're joined by a CPU controlled partner who'll fight alongside you. Not everything works absolutely flawlessly. The crazy combat does get a bit confusing at times. Your AI partner will spend an awful lot of time staring into space or running helplessly into walls. And with the enemies roaming around the countryside at random, it's not always entirely clear where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to be doing. I shouldn't be too harsh on it though. All in all, it's a good game, it's a good progression from the original, and it's definitely worth a go. And now a game that stepped out of obscurity recently, thanks to its translation, it's Sweet Home. A game that quite a few other YouTube have talked about recently but I couldn't resist including it on this list it's so good some people have called it the best game on the NES I don't know about that but it's certainly up there the core gameplay is JRPG there's random encounters turn-based combat experience levels all that kind of stuff but there's much more to it than that a lot of the RPG conventions are thrown out the window and the game is one of the originators of the survival horror genre the focus here is on exploration puzzle solving inventory management and of course survival right from the start you take control of five characters who can be controlled individually or teamed together in groups of up to three unique abilities limited opportunities for healing and permanent death means you'll have to make very judicious use of all the people in your teams. This dynamic, coupled with some fairly striking 8-bit graphics and all-around good design, makes this game really stand out amongst its peers. It's tough as nails, but you can save anywhere, which does make things a little bit easier. All in all, it's so fresh and so groundbreaking, you could almost believe it was one of those modern retro-inspired games like Shovel Knight or Undertale. Definitely worth a go. Konami's YY World why is it called YY World? Well, it turns out that YY is a Japanese onomatopoeia. I don't know why it's called YY World. Let's not get bogged down in the whys. Let's talk about the game. You could see this as Konami's take on Mega Man. Like Mega Man, you start off with a choice of levels to begin with. Initially, you'll start out in control of Konami Man and Konami Lady, and each level you beat will unlock a new character and a new web. It features an ensemble cast of characters pulled from other Konami games. Some you might recognise, some you might not, and some you might wonder why they're there in the first place. We've got Simon Belmont, Mikey from the Goonies, a Moai Head, Fuma from Getsu Fuma Den, Goemon, and King Kong, who did feature in his own Konami game at one point. Again, like Mega Man, you can tackle the levels in any order you like, but some will be easier once you've unlocked certain characters. The core gameplay is fairly typical late 80s action platformer type stuff and things are kept interesting with non-linear level layouts and puzzle solving elements. On defeat in all six of the starting levels the final boss level has a pretty cool horizontal scrolling shooter section. You may wonder what Konami were doing with their choice of characters especially considering some of the other franchises that Konami had at the time but each character adds something to the gameplay and feels unique. They did pick the most boring goonie, Sloth, 
junk mouth. All of them would have been better choices. But Mikey was featured in no less than two separate Konami games by this point. And no doubt Donkey Kong would have been better than King Kong, but I think that was a licensing bridge too far. It goes without saying that it's tough as nails, it is after all a 1980s Konami game. It features everyone's favourite way of saving, a lengthy password entry system. It starts out a bit slow, Konami man and Konami lady aren't all that much fun to begin with. But it's worth persevering because therein lies a good game. Fire Emblem, Nintendo's lost franchise. Okay, that's a little bit dramatic, but unlike most Nintendo published game series, this one hasn't had a lot of success in the West. It shouldn't be a surprise really, because Nintendo have always been rather reluctant to release these games over here. Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light is the first in this fairly long running series. And it's also the first true tactics RPG. If you're not familiar with the genre, it's got the combat from turn-based strategy, but with RPG elements added in. Instead of generic units, you usually have individual characters with experience levels, weapon upgrades, that kind of thing. And of course, a more complex storyline. It's a pattern that's been borrowed by many other games over the years, including Tactics Ogre, Ark the Lad, <laughs> and some, some others with equally stupid names, I'm sure. I can sort of see why this game wouldn't have a Western release. The gameplay is pretty technical, pretty complex, and was certainly a world away from the other games Nintendo was releasing at the time. It was created by the same team who later went on to create the Advance Wars series of games, and it shows a lot of the play mechanics are similar, and it's got the same feel. The whole thing's got the usual Nintendo level attention to detail. It's a well presented package with a reasonably intuitive user interface. It's not a game that I would unambiguously recommend to anyone, but if you're a fan of Fire Emblem, Advance Wars or just this genre in general, you may well enjoy it. And finally, another game that's become quite well known now thanks to its translation, Lagrange Point, an RPG from a company that's not usually associated with RPGs, Konami. This translation was 10 years in the making, and it's testament to just how difficult it is to translate these games. It's not just a case of translating the text and pasting it into the ROM file, although that in itself, of course, isn't easy. But oftentimes, games have to be hacked, modified, rewritten, to be able to display English text at all. And for a complex game like this, that's a big job. This is without a doubt one of the most technically impressive NES games you'll ever see. The graphics make brilliant use of the NES's fairly limited capabilities. And the sound? Well, it sounds like no other NES game, that's for certain, because it uses a six-channel FM sound synthesis chip built into the cartridge. Have a listen. It does sound more like a Mega Drive than an NES. The setting of this game is perhaps a bit different than your average JRPG from this era. It's less high fantasy and ludicrous haircuts and more of a hard sci-fi, aliens inspired plot. The gameplay is pretty much what you'd expect. Lots of exploration, cutscenes, endless random encounters, turn-based combat, multiple party members, weapon upgrades, you know what I'm talking about. And sheer size and breadth and scope, it's got more in common with 16-bit RPGs than it has with the earlier 8-bit ones. It ain't quite Chrono Trigger, but you know, it's not far off either. If you're not already a fan of JRPGs, this probably won't win you over, however. The usual frustrations are there. Those random encounters really are very frequent. You can't walk more than a couple of feet without being surprise attacked by some previously invisible space bug. Seems like the developers were aware of this and almost solved the problem by giving an auto-fight feature in the menu, which will let the AI take over and hopefully defeat those endless trash mobs. And you'll probably spend a fair amount of time talking to random NPCs hoping to trigger the next story event. Though like with Fire Emblem, if you're into this genre then you're probably going to like this game. It's a fine example of its type, a technical showpiece, and for JRPG fans, well you've got to at least give it a try. That's the end of my deep ruminations on NES games for now. You've got this far, thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, have a think about subscribing. It's what all the cool kids are doing these days, I assure you.